Oh, hey there, my Christmas creepy cravers. Welcome back to Cleaving Thought from Bone with your host, Sociopathic. Before you plate your tasty treats or take a bite thereafter, you may want to huddle close to your monitors. Tonight's warning is more relevant than you yet realize. Christmas Cookies Christmas is a holiday that has always been celebrated carelessly. Most anticipate the holiday with fancy decorations and sugary treats, but the origins of these traditions, the true origins of Christmas, have been nothing short of long since forgotten to the dusty annals of time, obscured by generations that respin all the arms until the result is something so obtuse that the origin is barely found within, if at all. Take the story of Santa Claus, for instance. Many would have you depict him as a fat, jolly old soul that brings joy to millions on one special night, soaring through the heavens at incredible speeds, aided by the help of flying arctic animals and magic. Well, the magic part is correct. Ever wonder why Santa doesn't leave presents, or, at the very least, spark the curiosity and fascination of adults? Why is it that as we get old, we lose faith? Does Santa fly? Possibly. That I cannot say for certain. He does, in fact, wear his signature red suit, all trimmed in white, although when I had seen it, that white had become a very dull shade of tattered gray. He's not an elf, a friendly spirit of Christmas, or a jolly fat man living in some sort of abstract gingerbread house at the North Pole. He is a conjuring, something summoned, something brought about only by faith and ritual. And somewhere along the way, he lost whatever essence of a man he may have once retained. He may have been human. He sure seems to at least be the remnant of one. Here's what I do know. Roman pagans introduced the holiday of Saturnalia, now transformed into Christmas, which was a week-long period of lawlessness, celebrated between December 17th and December 25th. Each Roman community selected a victim whom they forced to indulge in food and other physical pleasures throughout the week. At the festival's conclusion, December 25th, the Roman authorities believed that they were destroying the forces of darkness by brutally murdering this innocent man or woman. It was a time of rape, intoxication, and the consumption of human-shaped biscuits. In the 4th century, Christianity imported the Saturnalia festival, hoping to take in the pagan masses with it. In order to remedy the discrepancy, Christian leaders named Saturnalia's concluding day, December 25th, to be Jesus' birthday. As for St. Nick himself, Nicholas was born in Perara, Turkey, in 270 CE, and later became Bishop of Myra. He died in 345 CE on December 6th. Nicholas was among the most senior bishops who covened the Council of Nicaea and created the New Testament, in which the text they produced portrayed the Jews as the children of the devil, who sentenced Jesus to death. A group of sailors who idolized Nicholas moved his bones to a sanctuary in Italy, there, Nicholas supplanted a female boon-giving deity called the Grandmother, or Pasqua Epiphania, which became the center of the Nicholas cult. Members of this community gave each other gifts during the pagan they conducted annually on the anniversary of Nicholas's death, December 6th. The Catholic Church adopted the Nicholas cult and taught that he did, and they should 
distribute gifts on December 25th instead of December 6th. The December 6th tradition was given the context of a much darker ceremony, the true day of Christmas's original pagan origins in which Santa's evil counterpart, Krampus, appears and punishes bad children, as opposed to rewarding good ones. For me, it's obvious that at least one of these entities is false, because I know that the true Santa Claus leaves no purpose for Krampus, and for whatever reason he may show up, his intentions are not to leave you and your loved ones gifts. If he does, it's because it was evoked that way. Let me explain. What are you actually doing when you hang stockings by your fireplace with care? What about sprinkling oatmeal mixed with glitter in a trail outside your home for the reindeer to see and feed upon while St. Nick unloads his supposed sack of goodies? What about gathering around your real or fake tree, friends and family decorating it with flashy lights and reflective decorations? Well, you are performing a tradition, of course, or, in much more simple terms, a ritual. I know, but really, is it that hard to see? To wrap your mind around? Look at Halloween, for example. Many of us still perform the ritual of warding off evil spirits, lighting ghoulish lanterns made from the fruits of the fall harvest, hiding ourselves from would-be passed-over onlookers that may be looking in on us, wanting to warm themselves by our fireside. What about the gift of candy for those dressed as their favorite monsters? The appeasement of possible spirits of the dead that may have come a-calling. We do all these things every single year, as ritual dictates, and most of us don't even realize our participation. So, is it really all that strange for Christmas to be any different? Well, of course it isn't. What about the act of leaving out Christmas cookies, plattered nicely and placed conveniently somewhere adjacent to the fireplace beside a tall glass of milk? A harmless act to some, a tradition with no more thought given to it than baking a piping hot cranberry bread or adorning everything with red and green, drowning tabletops and windows with colored fabrics, or especially placing those electric candles on the sill next to a portal of frosty glass, be it red, green, white, or blue, it doesn't matter. If you don't believe me, you can always try it for yourself. But you may not like what you find. This isn't one of those ritual stories where, if performed and or endured correctly, you may reclaim your salvation. No, this is more of a warning. But if you're the persistent type, then place one of those electric plug-in candles in your bedroom window. Make sure your tree is decorated and shining very, very brightly all night long. And last but not least, leave your offering. The coin of the realm currently is cookies and milk, which tends to work just fine. And that's it. Go to sleep, and the next morning, you should find something for you somewhere in your home, near the tree. Good or bad, it will have not been there the night before. Yeah, I know, most of you know this ritual, and whether you believe it or not, most of you follow it to the letter each and every December 24th. Hell, people have been performing it over and over again for generations, including my own parents. But let me proposition you a point of insight, enlightenment. What, my friend, happens when this ritual is performed incorrectly? Well, usually one of two things. A. Nothing happens. Nothing good, nothing bad. Just 
nothing. B. Something happens. And something goes wrong. Typically, be it horribly wrong. Summon a demon and break the circle, and you're no longer protected from its wrath. Put out the light of a jack-o'-lantern before midnight on All Hallows' Eve, and you invite evil into your home. My parents were non-believers. That much is painfully obvious. My dad, for my mother's sake, would light one red electric candle and place it in the master bedroom window for my mother, an annual sentimental ritual he performed for her in memory of their life before children when they were younger. I remember the Christmases I spent around the tree, trimming it with my mom, my dad, and my aunts, uncles, and grandparents that may have dropped by. My mom would host this extravagant Christmas Eve party every year, and every year after the guests had left, I would help my dad with our gifts for Santa by pouring the milk while he plated the cookies. Dad would carry the milk, though, when I was younger, and I the cookies. We would set everything down on the small table beside the step in front of the fireplace, our tree shining brightly in the corner of the room. Dad would gently nudge me to the kitchen, where my mother would be tidying up after the night's festivities. And after I had said my good nights to her, Dad would tuck me into my bed and request that I try my very best to sleep. See, the thing is, my bedroom was on the first floor of my parents' old house. It was far enough out of reach of the living room, but on that one eventful Christmas that I will never forget. I had forgotten to go to the bathroom before my father had tucked me into the covers, and the bathroom was only right down the hall from the living room, with an eye shot. I held it for as long as I could. I still believed in Santa, and I suppose rightfully so. So I did my best to just go to sleep, in fear of being skipped over by St. Nick, because I wasn't sleeping. But eventually, my bladder and tolerance would be reached, and I would be forced out of my bed on a mission for the bathroom down the hall. I wanted to make it quick, but I also wanted to remain quiet, undetected, just in case Santa was in the midst of placing gifts beneath the tree. So, moving relatively swiftly, I made my way to the bathroom door across the plush shag carpeting. Just when I was about to reach it, I saw something move in the living room, nearby the tree. My heart skipped a beat, and I think I forgot to breathe. And then I saw him. My father, eating the cookies he and I had left for Santa Claus, beside a colorful tree, the stacks of presents already placed beneath. Then, I watched him wash it all down with a glass of milk, leaving nothing but crumbs and white residue in his wake. I made sure to hide in the shadows as I watched him walk by and up the stairs towards his and Mom's bedroom. When I was sure he was gone, the call of nature demanding, I first went to the bathroom before going to inspect the presents beneath the tree. Most of them were from Mom and Dad, but there were a few marked from Santa. My attention shifted to the fireplace, and I noticed the long red stockings, each already stuffed to its brim with treats and small box-shaped objects protruding through the fabric. It was him. I knew it was my father. He had left the gifts, ate the cookies, and drank the milk for himself. I sobbed myself to sleep that night. It only took a short while for my sad little self to pass out. But the slumber wouldn't last long. It started with a thump, a loud clomp that roused me from sleep. And it sounded close. It sounded like the living room. I turned my head to the window, expecting to find daylight, but 
found none. Curious, I then crept from my covers and out my bedroom door. Ever so softly, I tiptoed down the hall and neared the bathroom door. It was a man in a red suit. The white trim on its edges, gray and filthy with unwashed soot and age. His black boots dripped with water, ashes, and mud. With his back turned, I saw that his head was concealed by the tail of his stocking-like cap, complete with a gray, dingy ball of fluff. A wrinkly claw-like hand, skeletal fingers, wrapped in sagging skin, extended outwards and reached for the empty plate that had been polished off some time beforehand by my father. Slowly, it lifted it up and seemingly stared at it for a while. Then, I heard it. It sniffed. It was sniffing the dish. With a grunt, the thing set the plate back where he had gotten it from with a thud. Next, he checked the glass. This he picked up, gave a shake, and slammed it back into place violently, making a sound that was just short of a scream. I just couldn't help myself. I had to know. I had to let him know. Santa? I'm sorry, Dad? The thing turned to me with a ferocity in its eyes that looked so malicious they may as well have been gleaming as red as his dirty old suit. His cheeks were sunken in and his eyes were solid white. The large red suit seemed to sag from his body as if it were ten sizes too large. The last thing I saw of him were his brown and yellowish teeth as he rushed me with his mouth stretched wide open in a scream. The next thing I knew I was in my bed. I don't remember blacking out or dreaming. I was just simply in my bed, opening my eyes to a pale, white ceiling adorned with the first breaths of winter morning daylight. It wasn't presence or the time I had lost. I only wanted to check the circumstances of the living room. I threw off the covers and dashed down the hall, coming to a screeching halt in the living room, paralyzed in horror by my gruesome discovery. No, I thought to myself. It can't be. I ran up the stairs and burst through my parents' doors without even considering a knock. And there they were. What was left of them, anyway? Just like a moth to a flame, he followed his path to their light, the candle in their window alone. I'm sure of this now. The room was splattered with wall-to-wall -wall blood, nearly painted in tacky, still-drying crimson. My parents' bodies lay in their bed, propped up against the headboard at the back wall, each of them missing their heads, the objects I discovered resting upon the cookie plate in the living room, their eyes wide open and a large pool of blood on the floor beneath them, becoming increasingly larger with each rhythmic drip. Do I still celebrate Christmas? Well, I didn't for a while. But honestly, yeah. I do now. I mean, I have a family of my own now. It's kind of difficult to deny a child Christmas. But now, I know enough to protect myself, abide by the traditions and stipulations of ritual. Either leave an offering, or don't. Neither will bring you any danger or harm but if you decide to leave a tribute nearby your Christmas tree, 
some red and green sprinkled Christmas cookies, and a glass of cold milk. Make sure you and yours leave it be in the spirit in which it was given. It is intended for something else. Well, everything goes better with sprinkles, even the deaths of your loved ones and close relatives. So, here's me wishing you not just a Merry Christmas, but an adherent one as well. And if you survive the holidays, make sure to give me a Christmas present of my own by liking, sharing, subscribing, and turning on notifications so I can slay you all again next Saturday. <laughs> <laughs>